Not two. Trouble's going. She's gone. For centuries, parishioners throughout the land have been summoned to worship by the sound of church bells. But here at St Mary's Walton-on-Thames in Surrey, this is the first Sunday on which the bells have been rung for seven months after extensive restoration work in the tower. Hilary Brooks, the tower secretary, explains. The project is because our bells, three of which are heritage bells, one of which is cracked, need to come out and be rehung in a new steel frame. St Mary's Church has stood on this site for at least 900 years. There is mention of a church here in the Doomsday Book in 1086 and, due to the alignment with the shifting magnetic north, there is some suggestion that the foundations may have been laid as far back as the 8th century. The present structure includes these round Norman columns along the north aisle, dating from around 1150. The chancel dates from the 14th century and the south aisle from the same period. The tower was built around 1450 and extensively restored in the 19th century, at which time the oak bell frame was installed. The old oak frame was put in in the 1880s and although it was good for the times, it doesn't give an easy ring. If you get a heavier bell next to a lighter bell, they work in sort of dissonance and therefore the bells become more difficult to ring. This is our treble bell. David Misseldeen, the tower captain and man responsible for the work at Walton, showed me firsthand the work that was necessary. Well, basically, the, we, we, we were breaking gudgeons. The gudgeons, the gear on the bells has been on there since 1883. Obviously, it's getting very dated at the present time. The uh, treble is the latest uh, one that's broken, and um, that now is out of action. Nicholson Engineering first did the inspection at Walton on Thames in 2006, and um, the report threw up various um, potential problems with the, with the installation. The worst being that the, the seventh bell actually has a crack in it across the crown. Yeah. The fact that um, the, the ringing fittings themselves were starting to come to the end of their life and were, were showing a lot of signs of fatigue in the frame and fittings. And the, the project that was determined by the church was, was to go for a complete new bell frame and fittings uh, as, as well as having the seventh uh, bell repaired. The current main entrance to the church is at the west end, at the base of the 60-foot tower. Above the entrance is the ringers gallery. Above the bell ringers is the clock gallery housing the 1905 clock mechanism, which would need to be dismantled to allow the removal of the bells and frame above. Refurbishment of the clock and replacement of its winding mechanism with an auto winder was therefore included in the project. Despite much of the work being done by local volunteers, the project was going to cost in the region of £100,000. The restoration project is going to be funded in several ways. We're looking for personal donations and we have applied for grants in all sorts of places and some of the companies have been very generous. CETA Trust, the um, waste management people, they've given us £18,500. Wow. Mike Bale is the master of the Guildford Diocesan Guild of Church Bell Ringers, one of the associations approached for a grant. Yes, the Guild have made a donation of £20,000 towards the, to, towards the project. The Guild does a lot of fundraising for restoration projects for towers around the diocese. It's one of the main functions to, to keep the bells of, of uh, the Diocese of Guildford ringing. Mike is speaking after abseiling down St Mary's Tower in one of many sponsored events to help raise money for the fund. We've tried to get as many different sections of the community as possible, um, people that are not necessarily people going to our church, but it's easy to raise money for bells.
But what if fundraising leaves a shortfall? We're um, also very lucky that the Church Fund Trust, which is part of the monies that the church itself has here, will fund anything that we can't raise. With funding guaranteed, the physical work commences in October 2010. In the clock gallery, the mechanism is carefully dismantled by a specialist company before being taken away for cleaning and maintenance. In the future, this handle, which has been used to wind up the clock every week, will no longer be needed but it will be stored in the tower, along with the weights that have driven the clock for more than a century, thus preserving a little more of the tower's heritage. Looking around the tower, I note that graffiti is hardly a new phenomenon. I wonder if this is the same Jay Dixon with whom I served in the choir in the late 1960s. At the top of the tower, David Misseldine and his team have fixed two steel joists into the walls. They are in the process of balancing a third joist across them. This will provide the anchorage for the strops, pulleys and winches used for lowering and raising the bells and frame through the centre of the tower. With the clock removed and the floors opened up, work can begin on clearing the tower of debris. Alan Britton has arrived from Nicholson Engineering and will spend two weeks supervising the removal of the bells and frame. Parts of the frame have already been removed and the 2100 weight tenor, the largest of the bells, has been lowered through the tower. Next comes the seven, the bell with the crack. In the cramped space above, the team hang pulleys from the steel joists using woven strops. David Misseldine and Allen wind more strops around the headstock of the seven and these are attached to the chain pulleys. With the bearings unbolted from the frame, the bell and headstock can be lifted clear. Next the bell has to be moved into position for lowering by swinging from one pulley to another. Once in position, Mike Fuller lowers the seven into the clock gallery below. Here, it is hooked onto an electric winch positioned over the hole which leads down to the bottom of the tower. There's a minor hiccup as the headstock doesn't quite fit through the hole. But this is soon resolved by removing one of the bearings and the bell is lowered easily onto an awaiting pallet. Two down and six to go. November morning, the bells are removed from their storage at the back of the nave, ready for their trip to the West Country. This is the first time in living memory these bells have seen daylight. St Mary's now has a ring of eight bells, tuned to the scale of E major. Three of the bells were cast at the time the frame was installed, in 1883, although the six has a much older history. One of the bells is... Um purportedly a 15th century bell, but it was recast and therefore you can't class that as a, a very old bell. The five is the oldest, that's 1606, followed by 1608, followed by 1610. Uh, the heaviest bell, um, the tenor, is, uh, is around about four foot wide at the, uh, at the mouth. Uh, well, 2100 weight is the, is the weight of the tenor, so it's just over a ton. Quite a heavy piece of thing to heave about. And so, over the next couple of hours, four tonnes of local history is carefully loaded onto a flatbed truck, which will take the bells away from Alton-on-Thames for a while for a little R&R. &R. 
repair and refurbishment and their first hanging in the new frame in Nicholson's workshop. Andy stays for another two weeks to assist with the removal of the rest of the frame. Then the volunteers get to work repairing the tower, using traditional materials such as lime mortar wherever possible. Later the louvres are replaced and new baffles are installed behind them for the comfort of the church's neighbours. And the work we're doing here at the moment is providing a foundation for the girders or the beams for this steel frame. We've made holes in the masonry, which you can see. Uh, that's the flint and mortar walls. There are two main beams, which will go crossways. They're about 16 inches deep. And on top of those two beams will sit some other steel beams, which will be the foundation for the steel frame itself. We had to draw up a, a plan of the, uh, the proposed bell frame and, and it was decided that we would go for a, a, an installation with the seven bells on one tier and the repaired seventh up above, so a two-tier bell frame. The advantage in the layout is that it, it balances out the, uh, the directions of the, the eight bells swinging so that it's more evenly balanced and therefore much kinder on the tower itself. It's all quite a tight fit within the tower, so it just, it's a lot, of, a lot of careful measuring and a lot of careful planning work to actually fit that number of bells um, in, into, a, into a modern frame. The old headstocks were all, all basically scrapped. The new headstocks were made for all, all the, the ring. Um, the actual modern headstock is fixed to the bells with, with bell bolts and that also helps preserve the integrity of the bell for, for long term. We've now got a whole new set of clappers. The wheels are a combination of oak and ash, and the stays are all ash. So there's quite, there's quite a bit of a, a hardwood involved in in, a, in, right. a, in what is mainly sort of a modern engineering job. Throughout much of bell ringing history, large bells have been rung using the method seen here at Ripley. The bell is rung simply by pulling on a lever attached to the headstock. The disadvantage of this method is that the timing of the rings is entirely dependent upon the pendulum motion of the bell. In the 17th century, a new method of hanging bells which overcomes this limitation was developed in England. In full circle ringing, the headstock is attached to a large wheel around which a rope is passed. This allows the bell to be paused in a mouth-up position, giving the ringer much more control over the timing of the rings. When there are several bells, the method allows the order in which the bells are rung to be changed, and this change ringing, or ringing the changes, is the familiar sound we hear up and down England every Sunday morning. This method is peculiarly English, as more than 90% of churches throughout the world that use circular ringing are located in England. But before ringing can be resumed at Walton, the new frame has to be installed and the bells rehung. Yeah, once the bells and the frame arrive on a lorry, there's a there's a quite a lot of work just to get the amount of steelwork and the bells themselves up into the church area. And then you've got about a week of work to do what is a, effectively a sort of a Meccano construction of, of, of steelwork up inside the tower.
then there'll be another route to do the building work to actually set the, the new frame into the walls and then from there there's about another fortnight of work to arrange the fittings and the rope work to the bells that, that uh, and, and do the fine tuning of the bells and, and the, the action of them. Friday the 24th of June 2011. Some of the more adventurous bell ringers inspect the work before the first rehearsal. Trouble's going, she's gone. There is a little trouble ringing the one ton tenor up. But with a bit of additional manpower, the mission is accomplished. Two days later, the congregation attends a service of rededication of the bells, led by the vicar, the Reverend Canon Charles Stewart. Bless, sanctify and hallow these bells, we pray, which we dedicate anew in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But the story isn't quite over yet. Once the clock gallery is made good, the 1905 clock is reinstalled, this time with electric motors driving the clock and ringing mechanisms. There was uh, more work done at uh, the top of the tower. The ladders to the upper portions of the frame uh, have since been fixed. The clapper to the tenor, uh, which had trouble uh, clappering the right side when it was being pulled up, uh, has now been uh, remade and uh, refitted. It's um, now got a cast iron uh, ball and top and with a um, shaft made of a more flexible material, which, um, which is much, much better than uh, the original clapper. Responses from uh, from our bell ringers has been very very favourable uh, in the fact that the bells now are much much easier to ring and um, well a pleasure really rather than uh, rather than a lot of hard work which they possibly were before. Okay, look to <laughs> Trevor's going gone. We would like to thank absolutely everybody who'd had anything at all to do with this project, whether it was helping with events, whether it was buying jams and pickles, whether it was um, personal donations and funding. These are the people yes. that have made these bells such a joy to ring. Go round to doubles. Thank <laughs> you.